So we've been talking about powers of sine and cosine, um, specifically odd powers of sine and cosine. I've reminded myself of how even powers are done and made the determination that it's just not worth it for us. We'd have to memorize four um, new trigonometric identities. I mean, I say new in theory, you've seen them in pre-calculus, but trigonometric identities in pre-calculus are like dust in the wind. Um, so let's just do a few more examples with odd powers and I can't actually remember, but my guess is that yesterday the examples I did were odd powers of the sine, because the sine is kind of my go-to trig function. Well, good news, odd powers of the cosine are handled in just the same way. And let's remind ourselves of what that same way is. It is to break the odd power apart so that now we have an even power times a cosine times a sine squared. And again, the way the textbooks, um, well, that's not always true, but the way textbooks tend to present this as if it's a magic trick. I mean, you do this and somehow you get the wrong answer, but our goal when let's, um, let's try not to do this as a magic trick, let's try to be clear what we're doing and why. Our goal is to let you be the trig function we don't have a power of. So our goal, or we don't have an odd power of. So here our goal is to let you be the sign the reason we're breaking that apart is so that we'll have a du and be able to do substitution. The sine squared will turn into u squared. It shouldn't cause a problem. So what we need for this substitution to work is to turn that even power of the cosine into sides so that they'll turn into u when we do this substitution. The trick here, and it is a trick, it's just something you have to sort of internalize. <laughs> is that an even power can be written as a square. And again, that's why for this process to work, we need to start with an odd power because pulling the cosine out turned the odd power into an even power. The five turned into four. And we need an even power so that we can do that step. And then the second, <laughs> the second part of this trick and the answer to the question, well, why would you want to rewrite this as a square? 
square raised to a power is that if we have a square of a sine or a cosine, we can switch from one to the other using the Pythagorean identity. And, I mean, at first blush, this <clears throat> might look like we're making this thing worse instead of better, but we've already suggested the trick we want to use which is to let u be the trig function we don't have an odd power of. And that will then enable us to convert entirely to u's. One minus u squared squared. This cosine and this dx are going to turn into du. And then the sine squared is u squared. And the only thing about this technique, it will always work out this way, where you have a polynomial raised to a power, maybe times another power. And we talked about this yesterday, but sort of the, the only thing about this is that to take this integral, we do have to just foil and distribute everything out. So I foiled that put, um, square, it's one minus two u squared plus u to the fourth. And then we've got that u squared and that u squared distributes across. So let's jot down. This was the substitution we did. We have u squared minus two u to the fourth plus u to the sixth du. And now we can, we can hopefully proceed. I mean, I say hopefully, we definitely can proceed as long as we remember how to integrate the polynomial which I hope is basically second nature at this point. So we get, I mean, the, the integral we get from this looks like nothing on earth. Just this sort of polynomial looking thing, except that instead of powers of X, we have powers of the trig functions. But we are able to find the integral this way. What if, what if both 
sine and the cosine are being raised to odd power. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of ideal. It means that we can do this problem in two ways. Um, we'll take an odd power, we'll split it up, we'll use the Pythagorean identity, and so forth. If you have a choice, if you have two odd powers, You should always split up the smaller power. And that's because the power you split up is going to give us the exponent here. And if we have a large number here, it will be difficult to distribute and foil. Whereas if we have a small number, it will be more straight. Forward. As we'll see here, I'll take my advice, take my own advice, and split up the sign. Then that odd power of the cosine is. That seventh power is looking maybe intimidating, but it's going to end up just turning into a u to the seventh. And I mean, the step where we distribute the power of u multiplied by a polynomial, this isn't made harder by having hard, large powers of u. Like if instead of u squared, we had u to the 12th. We just, I mean, because we're adding. Having high powers doesn't trouble us. There, this sign is going to turn into the du. So that leaves us with this sine squared to worry about. And sine squared is one minus the cosine squared. And uh, because three is the smallest power, the smallest odd power, we use this technique with, I should say. And um, the next step, ordinarily we write the sine squared, or we'd write the, um, the sine squared to a power, but there's no need. We've just got the sine squared. It's one minus the cosine squared. Times the sine of x dx. And now, we can let u be the cosine of x. Again, we are always letting u be the power that we don't split up. du has a negative sign, but hopefully this is second nature by now. We put in the negative sign we want, and we put in another negative sign to cancel it out. So we're not changing the integral. 
and we get negative the integral So that cosine squared to the seventh is going to turn into u to the seventh. This negative sine dx is going to turn into du. One minus cosine squared is going to turn into one minus u squared. Let me see. So negative u to the seventh minus u to the ninth du. As I said, the fact that seven is kind of a high power does not make it harder to distribute. So negative, let me jot down you. Uh, cosine. So negative the integral u to the seventh minus u to the ninth equals negative one eighth u to the eighth minus one tenth u to the tenth plus c negative one eighth, the cosine to the eighth power x minus one tenth, the cosine to the tenth power of x plus c. All right, what else have I got? As I say, there's plenty of stuff in this section that I'm just not looking at. I don't think, I think it gives students a warped idea of what calculus is actually used for to turn it into a long laundry list of tricks. Like if you see a square root, then it look, that's not really my thing. So I'm intentionally cutting this section a little short. I guess one thing I could comment on is once we get to chapter eight and start taking integrals, the fundamental theorem kind of fades into the background because taking the indefinite integral is the hard part of using the fundamental theorem. So it's the part that we emphasize. But you know, if instead of the integral of the cosine to the seventh times the sine cubed, we had a definite integral. We could certainly take that. Um, I would not bother keeping, I would um, not bother keeping the limits of integration. I would um, just take the indefinite integral first. That's especially true because um, this process always involves U substitution and doing U substitution when you have the limits of integration right there is kind of weird. Um, but once we find this antiderivative,
Don't need the plus C. This, uh, this just ends up being, well, whatever it is. I hope we're going to get nice stuff. I mean, it looks... For almost any limits of integration, we'd get horrible numbers. So, of course, zero and pi were cheats to make the cosine be nice when we stuck those in. Um, so, we stick pi in, we get negative one. All right, negative one to the eighth is positive one. Stick pi in here, we get negative one, but negative one to the tenth is positive one. So stick zero in, you get, huh, as a matter of fact, Stick zero in, we get um, one. One to the eighth is still one. Let's see. Stick pi in, we get one. One to the tenth is one. So as a matter of fact, we get zero which, sure, I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking it's a weird thing to get, but why would it be weird? I did not go into this problem with any idea of what this definite integral should be. See, cosine to the seventh, sine cubed. No, no, no. That's... Come on, Desmos, work with me here. Okay, and yeah, I guess now that I'm looking at the graph, this makes perfect sense to me. If the we think of the integral as the weighted area under the curve, this region around here and this region around here are exactly the same size, but the area above the curve is positive and the area below the curve is negative. So those cancel each other out and give us a definite integral of zero, exactly what we did get. 